Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Real Intent with Roger Hughes, who's going to talk about some of the real pain that we're starting to experience in verification. So, Roger, what are, what are some of the problems that we're starting to face in verification? What do you see? Issues now are the designs are getting much larger. We're going into gigascale designs where there are literally a billion uh, gates on the actual design. And that also causes new issues now in terms of um, dealing with metastability because you want the real time between failure to be reduced. And often this results in much more complex synchronizers being used in a design. And there's a lot of greater use in terms of hierarchy in the overall design flow to address this complexity. And whilst doing full chip flat verification is possible, it is difficult to try to uh, accommodate a full chip design in a lot of modern design fields because they're using existing, pre-existing IP, they're inheriting designs that they've previously done, and they want to be able to do the complete verification for the whole whole chip, but do it in an incremental bottom-up manner. What do you draw this out for us? So typically in lots of designs, there have been a typical sort of design block might have various synchronizers inside it, might be a two-flop synchronizer, might be a four-flop synchronizer, as you can see here, going from one clock domain to another. Now that's easy to verify in terms of a simple block, as it were, of an overall design that might be several million gates. But when you're going to much larger designs, where this could be a, a, a giga scale design, where there could be over a, a, sort of a billion actual uh, NAN2 gates on the design, then clearly you're going to have various design blocks, A, B, C here, that are basically each going to have their own synchronizers, but there's going to be a need to also verify the synchronization between the different design blocks. And what's happening here is you want to be able to hide certain bits of information, but you also want to be able to verify designs working the right way. Now consider one of the problems that you could have. Suppose you're looking at this particular block here. If it's been previously proven for a couple of different clocks, you might have a couple of clock ports coming in here, basically one for this clock going here and another one feeding through to these other flops, then what you're going to have is there's going to be two different clock ports on here, we'll label them one and two. If you've proven this block for particular frequencies, then it's going to work in a certain manner. But now you've inserted it into this overall design, what's now going to happen? Those might be the one and two here that you're basically addressing for the overall design. But now when you insert it in a larger design, have the actual clock frequencies changed? Are you going to end up with a different verification? And so this is why we need to be able to, in order to do a bottom-up verification, you have to be able to extract the environmental information from that environment. And then when you're doing a top-level verification run, you need to understand what the changes are in that environment to ensure that the clocks are mapped appropriately uh, in the top-level design versus the previously verified element and be alerted to when those things have changed, because you might need to re-verify this design based on the new frequencies that are known about in the top-level design. Where do engineers in verification typically go wrong with this? Typically, they make um, an assumption here which says the environment isn't going to change. They do a verification on their lower-level block, say, call it good, and then move up to a higher level in the design hierarchy, and don't recheck to see if the environment has changed. If they don't have any environmental checks, then as a result, they'll do a verification at this top level, not verifying the internal crossings within the design, not verifying the crossings between different design blocks, and as a result, will potentially mass mark something as this is good when actually the clocks may have changed in frequency and it may no longer pass, for example, a pulse width check is a game that's a formal check that is tied in to the overall verification analysis. How would a flat approach in verification differ from what you're doing here? A flat approach basically takes the entire design and basically just reads the whole thing into memory. Now to do that for um, 10 million gates, 100 million gates is fairly reasonably easy on large machines. However, you're trying to do that for a billion gates. This now becomes quite difficult to read the whole thing in in one go. And you're talking about 
typically needing multiple terabytes of on a particular machine server, which is a very large amount of RAM. So you're at the maximum machine limits, which is why people for the really large designs are wanting to adopt a bottom-up flow in terms of verification. We hear a lot about clock domain crossing. What exactly are we talking about? I mean, that's a term that's bandied about pretty regularly, but what exactly is it and how does it really change as we get into billion gate designs? In clock domain crossings, what we have is the concept of multiple asynchronous clocks within the design. Whenever you have data moving from one clock domain to another, uh, there's a possibility that the receiving flocks can become metastable um, when there's a data change at the same time as the clock edge occurs. And that always occurs whenever you have asynchronous designs. So this is what we, so clock domain crossing checking is the concept of ensuring that there is a, on a control circuit, that there is a receiving synchronizer to basically synchronize the, the control data to the receiving domain's clock. And so what you'll often see is like diagrams like this where there could be a control circuit where there's a transmit flock which is on one clock frequency and then there'll be a pair, here's a pair of receiving flocks in a different clock frequency that will be synchronizing that signal to the receiving clock domain. Now synchronizers can sometimes be two flocks deep, that's the minimum, or you could have three, four, five, as many as required depending on the ratios of the clock frequencies and the data frequency. This affects the overall probability of the mean time between failure. So if mean time between failure is of a concern for a designer, what they'll typically do with larger designs is they will try to reduce the overall mean time between failure. Now the problem occurs is that the MTBF for each particular synchronizer has to be calculated. So here we've got a synchronizer, we'll calculate the MTBF for that, Here's a synchronizer, we'll calculate the MTBF for that. The total MTBF of the circuit, of the whole circuit, is basically, it's one over the sum, sum of all the actual MTBFs of each of the synchronizers in the actual so there's one synchronized, another synchronized, so you calculate the MTBFs of each one, and the MTBF of the whole circuit is one over the sum of the MTBFs. Now the issue as designs get much larger, of course, is you're going to have much more synchronizers. There are more clocks in modern designs. It's no longer just four clocks, there's like a hundred clocks, all of which are asynchronous to another. So when you have a large number of clocks and the design gets very, very large indeed, then what you're talking about is the MTBF of the whole design is basically one over the sum of the MTBFs of each of the synchronizers. So in order to get a good MTBF for the whole design, you need basically at least n times the MTBF of each synchronizer has to be n times the MTBF of the whole design. So as a result of that, you're going to need much deeper synchronizers. And a lot of the um, CDC tools out in the marketplace have not really been designed to handle the complexities of large gigascale designs where they do need multiple depths of synchronization to be recognized automatically without relying on different models. Is this strictly a function of the number of transistors that are on a uh, number of blocks that are on a, a design, or is it also um, now a question of, are we moving into FinFETs? Are we moving into 252 two of the, the big uh, changes architecturally that are coming? Right. So, so that's a very interesting question. So it's a function of the number of gates in the overall design, but it's really a function also of the number of clocks, the frequencies of the clocks. So as the main clock frequencies are getting higher, we need to basically um, address various issues. The MTBF is basically going to be a function of the data input frequency. It's a function of the clock frequency that's being used. And it's also a function of the actual technology that's being used, because the gain function is dependent upon the capacitance. And as we're moving into smaller and smaller geometries, going now from like 22 nanometers and down, then that's going, that equation is going to change slightly. Previously, it's kept pace with each generation of technology, but that is going to change to the worse um, as technology moves forward. It's not predicted to remain constant any further. And as a result, um, with 
the next generation of technologies is going to really require very careful analysis of the meantime between failure for each of the synchronization stages when people are doing designs with multiple clocks. You know, mobile designs these days typically have multiple clock frequencies because they're trying to reduce power consumption. They need to dynamically alter different clock frequencies and select from one clock generator to another to another, dependent upon the various assumed loadings of the circuit in order to increase the maximum battery life of the circuit. And that's not just for the most advanced designs, right? That's just becoming ubiquitous in every design that's out there. It's true, it is becoming ubiquitous, um, but obviously for the larger designs it's even more problematic than the regular run-of-the-mill 10 million gauge design. You know, one of the things that we hear back from a lot of the verification engineers is that it's not always as clean as it sounds. There's always a bunch of uh, waivers that need to be put in here. We've got uh, lots of data that can be ignored, can't be ignored, and nobody really knows how to sort through it. What are you supposed to do in that case? Now, in the case of a large amount of data, often with a lot of designs, there'll be a huge number of warnings generated. And sometimes those warnings can be ignored. And you might say, oh, well, I'm getting a warning about this particular crossing here. Okay, I'm going to decide I'm going to wave that. Then I'll wave another crossing, wave another one. The problem is, as you get a large number of waivers for each particular module, when you reuse that module in a different design and do a different thing, you then need to, again, post-design, go through, edit a waiver file, do a lot of changes, very time-consuming, very manual. A better approach is to actually take an environment file at the very beginning where you basically just have some environment specifications and you actually pre-specify the conditions that you want to ignore up front so that you don't then have to repeat reanalyzing the results. Instead of getting results with false warnings, you're now eliminating those false warnings from occurring in the first place. It becomes part of the design specification effectively. The environment that you're running that verification in becomes part of the specification for that environment. And that's a more modern approach to actually address the post-design wavering approach is really sort of like a linting type technology. Here we're taking about talking about changing the environmental spec for the design and then taking those up front so that as things change later in the design, you don't have to keep reanalyzing the results every time you rerun the tool, you don't have to edit a filter file each and every time, you're just simply specifying upfront which things you need to not consider. Isn't this where formal's supposed to be really strong? Now, formal's you can be used very nicely in CPC, and a lot of um, you know our technology uses um, formal methods to address, for example, pulse width specs to make sure that the control pulse in a controller is actually wide enough to be received by the receiving clock domain. It has to be at least two rising edges long, in other words, two receiving clock pulse widths wide in order to be captured. And that's something where formal can actually prove if the control circuitry can generate a pulse that is wide enough. And of course, this is really important when you're looking at clock domain crossings where the frequency can change. You want to be able to analyze for one frequency, another frequency. You want to look at different ratios of frequencies to ensure that your overall synchronization circuitry can address that. Again, formal is also used for you know, combinational logic that may exist prior to some receiving synchronizer stage. You might have some combinational logic here, and that is clearly potentially problematic because if there's combinational logic prior to a receiving synchronizer, that could generate a glitch. What you want to do then is do formal analysis um, you know, two ways. is either remove that combination logic completely out of the way. That's one design approach. Another design approach is, oh, I haven't got enough time to do that. Is it really necessary? Or well, what you can do now is use formal methods to prove, it. does a glitch actually occur? If the glitch occurs, then you need to correct it. But if the glitch doesn't occur because the particular combinations of the circuit never cause the two lines to be activated at the same time, then clearly you won't get a glitch. Formal will demonstrate there is no glitch, and then you can safely leave that circuitry in. So there's multiple approaches, and Formal is a very powerful technology that's built into the verification tools to be able to actually allow that to occur. Roger Hughes, thanks for a great explanation of a really complex problem. It's my pleasure.